cells to kill the patient before we've killed the cancer cells to rid of the cancer. So what they're doing now is, um, some people anyway, they're trying to find drugs or a biomarker that will put into cancer cells which will only uh, attract the drug and the healthy cells won't. What it turns out, actually, this guy, Professor Dan Burke and, uh, in, in Britain, has established, is that cancer cells already have a biomarker and have always had a biomarker and he's called it CYP1B1. It is an enzyme that only appears in cancer cells and not healthy cells. What he then did was get with another man, Professor Potter at Leicester University, who came up with a substance found in many fruit and vegetables, which is called salvestrols. That's what they call it. And they found this. The CYP1B1 enzyme, only in cancer cells, interacts with salvestrols that we get from fruit and vegetables and turns it into a cancer-killing agent. So we have had a natural cancer response system. As long as we eat fruit and vegetables in rich numbers with these salvestrols in them, when we get a cancer cell, the CYP1B1 enzyme within the cancer cell, but not in the healthy one, creates a chemical reaction with the salvestrols and kills the cancer cell and doesn't harm normal cells. You get salvestrols in those fruit and vegetables that are subject to fungal attack because the salvestrols are what the fruit and vegetables produce to deal with a fungus attack. And the reason salvestrols work against cancer, because we're going to find out, and it's going to be uh, established eventually, cancer is actually a form of fungal attack on the body. Now, this is where I'm going. In the 1950s, they introduced chemical farming. From the 1950s, we have had an epidemic of cancer in the Western world. So what is the effect of this? Because they've been using fungicides on fruit and vegetables, they've been killing the funguses and the fungal attacks artificially, which means the, the fruit and vegetable plants are no longer producing salvestrols to, to, to deal with the fungal attack because it's being done externally for them. But here's the killer that they, they know what they're doing. The most used fungicides used in the world have another effect. They neutralize the effect of CYP1B1, the enzyme in cancer cells. So you can eat all the cell restaurants you like, but if your body accumulates the fungicide poisons through eating these foods, it won't matter anyway because the salvestrol will not be activated as a cancer killing agent because the enzyme within the cancer cell has been neutralized. And after 20 years of research of these people, that is absolutely no accident. They know exactly what they're doing. And that's why in America now, this bill um, is going through to make it virtually impossible for people to produce organic food in America when this bill goes through. Because if you eat organic fruit and vegetables of this type, then you have, you, they are rich in salvestrols because they're still producing them to fight off fungal attack because there's no fungicide getting in the way. Vaccines. 25 vaccines by the age of two. A emerging... A uh, growing immune system gets attacked with that shite in that period of time and we think that children are going to grow into adults with immune systems that are as effective as they could be, you're having a bloody laugh. And these uh, things that vaccines were supposed to get rid of were in free fall between the before the vaccines came in. Another scam. And of course the Immune system is the antivirus system. If that's not working, we become open to endless other attacks, which is what chemotherapy does in cancer treatment. It kills the cells in the immune system, which is why people that have chemotherapy have um, shot immune systems that open to other things. And so there's also a, an attack going on now, as we've seen through this uh, um, organization trying to um, reduce the doses and the sources of food supplements and stuff. It's all an attack. This guy... Uh, Codex Alimentarius, um, which is trying to uh, create um, regulations that basically 
make uh, food supplements and other things a waste of time because of the doses and the, the uh, quality of them. And Codex Alimentarius came out of the people behind the IG Farben chemical cartel, pharmaceutical cartel that was behind the Auschwitz concentration camps and much more. And this guy, Fritz Tamir, who was jailed by the Nuremberg trials for seven years for war crimes and was got out after four thanks to Nelson Rockefeller, his friend in America, um, he was the man with others in the 1960s that set up Codex Alimentarius, which is now um, uh, trying to destroy our ability to um, bridge the gap between what we used to get from fruit and vegetables and food and we don't get now. It's mass culling of the population, that's what they're after, and international law, international regulations is the way they're doing it. The reason international law is the, now, is the code word that you, or term that you see all the time now is because if you want a world government dictatorship, you have to have laws that everyone on the planet obeys and has to obey. That's where your dictatorship comes from. And that's why international law, international regulations are coming up everywhere. Same with this electromagnetic uh, suit that we live in now. It's attacking the body electromagnetically uh, and electrically to stop us um, uh, operating on the level that we can. Before we have a break, I'll just finish with this because this is so, so important. Um, the carbon con. We are being sold one of the most blatant lies, at least of modern times, and probably more than that. In this network, you'll see the Club of Rome, started in 1968. The Club of Rome is there to, within the network to manipulate the environmental movement to advance this agenda of global centralization. This is the um, founder of the Club of Rome, Ulio Pecci, quoted in one of its own publications in 1991. In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. And that is what they have done. The greenhouse effect. Oh, it doesn't let heat out, so the planet warms, and it's, it's the greenhouse gases, and it's, come, it's carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide has become the enemy, the villain. Without co well, carbon dioxide, first of all, in the greenhouse effect, the planet would be too cold for any life, and nothing would bloody grow without carbon dioxide, and we've turned it into the great bloody evil. And the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere... Um, in, in, in relationship to other greenhouse gases is fractional and the amount produced by human uh, 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 technology in the days of uh, Africa when, when there was cannibalism he said they had a golden rule that you must um, always boil the person um, to a certain temperature otherwise if you eat them you become them it's an old African kind of uh, rule because it's information um, and nothing identifies us more, I guess, with being the body computer as opposed to it being an experience than uh, being a man or a woman. That's who we are. I'm a man or a woman. No, it's the experience we're having. Very big difference. And there's nothing wrong with being a man or a woman. It's an experience. <laughs> nothing wrong with it at all. And, uh, you know, all the best with it, except that we need to uh, understand it's an experience and then don't we caught in the fact that it's who we are. A few years ago now, about two or three, four years ago, uh, in England there was a story in all the papers of Freaky the Chicken. Freaky the Chicken started out as a hen laying eggs and then had this massive, for some reason, burst of testosterone produced and started growing a comb, started crowing at dawn and chasing the hens. Uh, and all that had happened is there had been a chemical change in the computer and Freaky went from a woman to a man. And of course you see this in the manipulation of uh, sex change operations and stuff like that. If what we are is a man or a woman, how can the body computer change from one to the other with a chemical change? It's not who we are, it's an experience. 
I saw this on the BBC website. Scientists have been able to take control of flies' brains to make females behave just like males. Researchers genetically modified the insects so that a group of brain cells that control sexual behavior could be switched on by a pulse of light. The team was able to get female fruit flies to produce a courtship song, behavior usually seen uh, only in males. Again, it's the computer being manipulated. When I'm writing sometimes, I get up early in the morning in England, and when the sun comes up, the birds start singing. As soon as the sun comes up, the birds start singing. Now, is there, is there, um, is there someone with a, with, with, with a, a baton saying, Q? They just start singing. I mean, uh, here, here we have um, Freaky the Chicken, when he sort of got the testosterone uh, burst, he starts crowing at dawn. Who told him? No, no, the computer program was running. Just crowed at dawn. Another thing that we, um, we have, look at the time, <laughs> another thing we have, we're doing all right, is uh, emotions. We are our emotions. So many people who have near-death experiences, and I've, I've read a lot about this and I've talked to a number of them, they say that when we left the body, we did not feel emotion in the way that we did in the body. Because emotion is a chemical as a chemical expression. And chemicals can, if they're introduced to the body, can affect our uh, emotional state. There was a woman in England a few years ago who, uh, story again in all the papers, 40 years ago, out of nowhere, she went into a uh, clinical depressive state. 40 years, in and out of institutions. After 40 years, which is why she was in the papers, someone said to her, can you think of anything that happened about the time that this started? And she said, the only thing I could think of, she said, is I had 19 tooth fillings with mercury. So she was advised to get the, the mercury taken out, which she did, and go on a mercury detox, and the depression disappeared as fast as it came, and never to return. I've just found myself again, she said. Now, if you'd have said to her over that 40 years, who are you? She'd say, I'm a manic depressive. No, no. The body computer system had malfunctioned because of the chemicals introduced to it. And so often we identify who we are with things that we uh, appear to be in terms of our behavior, when actually it's just the body computer program playing out. It's not who we are at all. Good habits, bad habits. How many, time, how many times are good habits, bad habits, and all this stuff actually coming from the computer program, not from us? Does consciousness do good habits and bad habits? I'm not sure it does. So the way we decode reality um, depends to a very large extent on the state of the body computer. And the way that we live our lives depends on the way we identify who we are. And bringing this, this, this computer thing down to the brain, uh, the, the brain has two hemispheres, the right brain and the left brain with this corpus callosum bridge connecting the two. And they have very, very different roles to play in terms of uh, reality. The left brain is where most people in this world live. It's where the education system is fundamentally designed, cold, calculatedly designed to put us. And that is the part of the brain that perceives everything as a part, that deals in language, that deals in structure. And if you look at the society that we live in, it is a left-brain structured society because it is structured by left-brain dominated people. When you go through the education system, the indoctrination system, what happens? You progress within it by taking information, overwhelmingly left-brain information, words and numbers, holding it in there and then regurgitating it out onto an exam paper. And the better you do that, the more you progress within the system. And if you're really good at that, you go to big universities, and then if you get really good at that again, you get good degrees and you go into your specialization. Science, the law, often politics, and things like that. Medicine. And then you go through it in your specialization, in your exams, same thing. And then you, the top ones, progress into those positions of society 
that control the institutions of medicine and science and all the rest of it. And to have got there, they have to have become left brain prisoners as a result of the system they've been through. The right brain is about connection out into the greater self. It's where we get creativity from and inspiration from. That's where the artist resides. Artistic people and creative people are much more right brain than most. And that's where they get the creativity from because it connects them out into that realm of infinite creativity and potential. The idea, as with consciousness and mind, and this is very much symbolic of that, is to have that corpus colossum bridge passing information between the two so you get the best of both. That's not what the system wants. It doesn't want right brain people. And to give you a, an example of the difference between the two, get my glasses on. This is a lady called Jill Bolte Taylor. She is a neuroanatomist, brain scientist for short. And she had an incredible experience in 1996 where she had a stroke where she stayed conscious for a large amount of time while it was going on and it was a, a stroke, a hemorrhage in the left brain. And being a neuroanatomist, she was able to follow the experience like most people um, would not be able to because of her knowledge. And this is her story. She said she got up, wasn't feeling too great, jumped onto my exercise machine, she said, and I'm jamming away on this thing, and I'm realizing that my hands look like primitive claws grasping onto the bar. I thought, that's very peculiar. And I looked down at my body and I thought, whoa, I'm a weird looking thing. And it was as though my consciousness had shifted away from my normal perception of reality, where I'm the person on the machine having the experience, to some esoteric space where I'm witnessing myself having the experience. That's what consciousness does. When you move into consciousness, you start to witness the mind and, 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 and observe the mind as it's working in its chatter instead of being the chatter. I looked down at my arm and I realized that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. Because the left brain's shutting down, it's not decoding reality in the way it normally does, and so other levels of reality are able to be perceived because the decoding process is not um, uh, affecting them. I looked down at my arm and I realized that I can no longer define the boundaries of my body. I can't define where I begin and where I end because the atoms and the molecules of my arm blended with the atoms and molecules of the wall. And all I could detect was this energy, energy. And I'm asking myself, what's wrong with me? What's going on? And in that moment, my brain chatter, my left hemisphere brain chatter went totally silent. Just like someone uh, took a remote control and pushed the uh, mute button and total silence. Because it's not decoding anymore, the chatter stops. Suppressing this. We think we're the body, but it's the vehicle. Einstein said, this delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from the prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. In other words, once we lose the idea that we are individual little me, and realize we are all that is, we start to connect again with all that is and not just with a few people around us who um, connect into our sense of individuality and Ethel Jones and Charlie Smith. Any picture of this uh, theme, this um, type, is from a guy called Neil Haig. He's a great friend of mine in England, an artist, and he's a very, very original artist. And he has this unbelievable ability to not quite read my mind, because I do explain what I want and, and what I'd like him to portray and stuff, but he has this wonderful ability to then deliver a picture, and I go, crikey, if I was an artist, and I'm shite, um, I, I would draw it exactly like that. That's what was in my mind. It's an amazing connection that we seem to have. And this is the difference, um, a real important difference that I want to make. Okay, again, it's all words and it's how they're defined. I'm going to define the words for this day. 
consciousness is the word I'm using for what we really are. All that is, has been, ever will be. And consciousness has an experience within this reality if it chooses to. However, as I said about we must take on a shell and all that stuff to interact um, with this reality, it's very similar to if you want to go on the internet, you can't just sit there in a chair on an empty desk and go on the internet. You need a conduit, you need an interface through which you can access that collective reality we call the World Wide Web, and it's called a computer. What consciousness does is exactly the same in a fantastically more sophisticated way. It takes on what I call the biological computer, the body, to, as its interface. And the body and its immediate energy field, I'm calling the mind. And, and the the is very important. Because for me, the more that I kind of start to understand this, we talk about my mind, your mind, his mind, her mind. No, no, I would say that's not how it is. It's the mind. The mind is the interface between consciousness and this reality. And you can be a Wall Street banker over here and a New Ager over there and still be in the same mind. And what the conspiracy is about, in its primal level, is pulling us and our point of perception into the vehicle, into the interface, the mind, and out of consciousness. And what's happening now, and I'll get into this in the last section, is there are changes taking place vibrationally in this reality which is helping people to open their minds to consciousness um, and therefore uh, people are, as we say, waking up. Waking up from mind into consciousness. And the moment we start to do that, bang, we see the world in a completely different way. Why? Because our point of perception, our point of observation moves out of mind into consciousness. And the mind is a very good thing because we can use that to interact with this reality. And the mind operates through something called thought, which is a very, very low level of perception. Consciousness operates through something I call knowing. It's all knowing. It all, it's all that is, has been, and ever will be. Therefore, it's not constantly working things out. That's why when you enter a state of consciousness, you go into a place of silence. When you're stuck in mind or interacting with mind, that's what the chatter is all the time. The mind never shuts bloody hell up. Whereas you go into consciousness and there's silence. Why? We, we live in a world of things. And everything seems to be things. We live in a world of noise, constant noise now. But that's not the prime reality, though we think it is. The prime reality is consciousness, which is silence. It's silence because it doesn't have to work things out, because it knows. And we, we, we think silence is nothing. So we say, can you hear anything? No. Nothing. No. No thing. And yet, Everything comes out of the silence and goes back into the silence because what consciousness is at its highest level is all possibility, all potential. And in the silence is all potential, all possibility. And then when I start talking, I'm pulling through sound one possibility out of all possibility and now through the senses, now I'm in one possibility. So when I... When we have silence, and I start talking, the noise comes out of the silence. As soon as I stop talking, the, the noise goes back into the silence. And it's the same with space. With space, what is space? It's no thing. The reality here is things. But what defines this theater? As much as the things, the seats and the ceilings, what defines it is the no thing. And in the realm of things, things come out of the nothing. And then they go back. That's what's happening when we die. We're born into the, out of the nothing into the world of things, and then the body goes back into nothing. And one of the things that stresses people out, if we could come to terms with it, it would be a lot more helpful, is we're always trying to find stability and permanence in a world of things, when the world of things is by very definition 
totally impermanent. The permanence is the nothing, the silence, consciousness, which is what we always will be. And so when we come in to the mind, if we come in and hold that connection to consciousness, then we're in this world and we can use the mind to interact with it, but our point of observation is beyond it. And therefore we see things from this point of view. We become observers rather than caught in it. If we lose contact with consciousness, we come into this reality and we become prisoners of the mind in that eggshell. And now we're in this world and of it. And if we are in that state, we're not getting our inspiration and our knowingness from consciousness and getting a fix on who we are and the nature of reality. So where do we get it from? Through the five senses. And who's controlling that information? Those that control the media, those that control education, those that program one generation called parents who then program the next generation thinking they're doing the best for their kids. And so we have this mind-controlled society which is unconscious. Consciousness is like the ocean, the everything. Mind, of course, is a form of consciousness because everything is, but it's a much more concentrated and static and limited uh, form of consciousness that we call mind and thought. And we call it intellect, too. It's funny. Uh, well, it's not just funny. It kind of explains why we live in a society that worships the intellect. Oh, he's got a great mind. Oh, he's mindless. Oh, look at him. We worship the mind. We worship the intellect. We reward intellect. And we laugh and ridicule at those who come from a position of consciousness because intellect literally cannot get its mind round the perceptions and perspectives of consciousness because that's not where it's coming from. Let's just do that again. So if we open the mind, and all these phrases we use, and they're so, we, 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 we're, we're spouting these classic truths all the time. When we open our mind and let consciousness in, the mind becomes a servant to consciousness and not the governor of our perception. And that's the state that more and more people are starting to get into and therefore their perception of reality is transforming in an amazing way all around the world. I've been to nearly 50 countries now, I think it's 48 or something like that. I tell you what, this awakening's happening everywhere. And the question is, are we gonna be consciousness or are we gonna be mind? Are we gonna come from a perspective in our daily existence of being all that is or little me? That that's the difference between being free and being enslaved by these silly people in dark suits and those behind them. This guy essential to understanding two things. First of all, why society is structured as it is, which we're going to get into in this part, and also, um, as we get into the final part, what, how and why we can open the door and bring an end, end to this nonsense. So what I'm going to talk about in this section is, is some of the rather bizarre background to speak, and going into present day events, how that uh, pans out across the uh, What's happening now? So, the idea is to introduce, obviously, a big brother global society, very much in the global terms of 1984. And this is the basic structure they're looking for. And I'm going to go through a, a series in this section of what I call coordinates. We know the coordinates, the world starts to make sense, and what's happening in the world makes sense, because if you know the outcome uh, that is um, wanted, you can understand the sequence of events that is taking us there, and we can uh, understand there how we can intervene in that. So this is the structure. 
Very simply, if there's the few and you're going to control the many, you have to centralize decision making. Because the more points of decision making they are, the more diversity of decision making, the less control you're going to have over those decisions. It's like in the old, uh, the old days when I was a kid, they used to have lots of acts where they, they have people keeping plates spinning on sticks, loads of them all over the stage. And if you have too many plates and too many sticks, too many points of decision making, then you, you have plates crashing all over the place. You can't keep control of it. What you want really is one big plate and one big stick, which keep that going forever from a central point. That's the idea. And they want a structure with a world government that would dictate to every country in the world, a world central bank, well, I'll get into this more in this section, that's fundamentally, not only, but fundamentally one of the reasons for the uh, engineered uh, economic collapse, they want a one-world currency, electronic money, no cash, fundamental implications for freedom in that, uh, a uh, world army which would impose the will of the world government on any country that didn't want to accept it, and a microchip population connected to a global computer and the uh, global positioning satellite system. Under that, they want the super states, get into this uh, more later, uh, and under that, they want to break nation states up into regions which they're uh, already in the process of, of moving towards to de-unify in a unified response to the edifice of power above. So that's the basic structure. And once we realize that's the outcome they want, you can start to read the world and world events in a very different way. But what I would emphasize is I'm now going to talk about the play-out world, the world as it unfolds in the, the, the daily experience. But... The fundamental behind it is what we were talking about earlier. The whole thing is about manipulating the way we, manip we uh, decode reality, um, what we experience through the way we perceive the virtual reality game, to stop us uh, understanding that we are consciousness, to put us in the eggshells of little me, and to manipulate the way that we... Uh, ...our heads world. That's all the way running through everything. So, once upon a virtual reality, I'm going to just go through a, a sequence of events that kind of brought us to where we are now. Um, and it, I'll pick it up in this period, I don't know, 12,000 years ago, maybe more, where... There are so many stories and myths. I think it's about 2,000 books in print I was reading somewhere um, about Atlantis and, and these civilizations, of, of advanced civilizations, which existed in what is to conventional history, prehistory. And these civilizations were destroyed by vast cataclysmic events which you can see uh, recorded in the ancient texts and verbal histories of every single ancient culture. Of course, the famous one in the Bible is the Great Flood and all that stuff. But that is um, mirrored in uh, ancient cultures all over the world. This great cataclysmic um, period of geological and uh, upheavals and if you and volcanic upheavals and if you uh, there's a very good book called um, when the earth nearly died or the day the earth nearly died where the researchers have looked at the myths or what we call myths of all these uh, stories around the world of the great cataclysmic events and then they've looked at the biological and geological evidence to see if it supports the stories in the myths. And it does, very, very compellingly. And, um, of course, like I say, Noah uh, and the biblical story of the Great Flood is the most famous one, but you take that back to its origin, or at least one of its origins, and you go back into ancient Sumer long before where the same story was told, but it's told um, everywhere. Now, 98% of what I'm talking about today is come from 
hard research. Where it hasn't, I'll tell you. And I'd got to a certain point um, of taking this back from the physical to trying to get an understanding of what was behind these cataclysmic events and actually what's behind this crazy world, which at one time was not crazy. Probably not that long ago uh, was not crazy. Again, one of the other common themes is that before the cataclysmic events, there was a, what, what is often referred to as a golden age of great harmony and a great abundance when it was almost like a utopian world. And then the cataclysmic events came and everything changed. And I was in um, America um, at a place called Sedona in Arizona about uh, two months ago. Well, maybe less than that anyway, not that it matters. Um, and I went into this, shall we say, other state of consciousness. For many, many years, I've been going into coma-like states where I, it's just like unbelievably deep and sometimes it takes a half an hour 45 minutes to come out of them very very slowly but what suddenly happened in the last few weeks since the turn of the year is I'm going into these deep states but I'm holding consciousness when I go there and, and what, what happened to me as I went into one of these states just a few weeks ago I never talked about this before funnily enough um, and this kind of voice started talking to me about what the cataclysmic events were all about and what this situation in the world is all about. And I can only give it you and take it as you will. And what it was, was that at one point, well actually, not just at one point, but up to the point where these cataclysmic events happened, this, the energy field of this earth and further out was extremely harmonious, extremely balanced vibrating in a very balanced, harmonious way. And this manifested down to the physical, into the decoded world, as a balanced, loving, abundant, sharing, caring society, which was vastly, vastly different to the way it is now. And what I was then shown, and what the voice referred to, as the schism happened. And what I saw, I found this picture on the internet, which kind of gives a feel for it. What I saw as this voice was talking about the schism was a harmonious energy field, and then through the center of it went this bright blue, like electrical charge, almost like lightning. And everything started vibrating in a chaotic way. Um, and it called it the schism. And as this manifested down through the uh, vibrational into the decoded world, it manifested itself as a physical version of this schism, which was massive um, geological events, which not only transformed this reality or this part of this reality physically in the way that's recorded by the ancients and through to the present day, but it fundamentally changed this reality mentally and emotionally because suddenly we were living in a chaotic energy environment which was being decoded through the, into the physical and so, suddenly the chaos and conflict of the schism was manifesting itself as chaotic um, and conflict and all the rest of it that started to come into the world. And uh, two rivers, and of course, what do we call that today? Iraq. Now, the invasion of Iraq was for many reasons. Oil, yes. Control, yes. Multi-reasons. It's very rarely for one reason. But another reason in that package was because that land we now call Iraq is very historically significant to the bloodlines that in the modern world are behind things like the invasion of Iraq, also Egypt and the Indus Valley uh, culture. And this particularly is very significant in terms of the way the world is controlled today. Sumer, which became Babylon, and again, you have the stories from thousands of 
uh, clay tablets that were found um, in Iraq and have been uh, translated. I call them the Sumerian tablets. And they talk, like all these others around the world, of this interbreeding between non-humans and humans to create this hybrid bloodline. As I've, I've, I'm going to go too much into this because there's so much about the present day I want to get to, through in this section. But um, these bloodlines, these hybrids, became the, the elite. They claimed to be, one of their terms was demigods, part human, part gods, as these non-human uh, groups were perceived to be because they, they had abilities to do things because of their advanced knowledge that made them appear godlike. And uh, the old, ancient, recurring theme of the divine right to rule, which is what? The right to rule because of your bloodline, because of your DNA. We have a head of state. You have a head of state. Same one in Buckingham Palace, who is only head of state because of her bloodline, because of her DNA. If she had a different DNA, she might be cleaning the throne, not sitting on it. That's how ridiculous it is. So even today we have this still running. And in the background, among those that control banking and business and media, we seriously have it running. It's just not official like it is with the official royal families. And these demigods, these hybrid bloodlines were the ones that ended up in the positions of royal power and they fought among each other like crazy. For instance, even in China, they, the emperors um, claimed the right to be emperor because of their connection to what they called the serpent gods. And, and, and that's a common theme, the serpent or the, the reptilian figure. So these uh, bloodlines, let me uh, just hold on that for a second. These bloodlines moved out of that part of the world as uh, what we call time past, and they moved up into Europe. And one of the places that they established themselves was Rome, where they were the bloodlines behind the Roman Empire. Now, one of the common themes that you find wherever these bloodlines went um, is an empire. You had the Babylonian Empire, for instance. They had the Sumer Empire before that, though it's not recognized in official um, history too much and then you had the Roman Empire and then they moved up into northern Europe and eventually located their headquarters in Britain particularly London and what followed that the British Empire on which it was said the Sun never set because it was so vast and then uh, we had this sleight of hand because what the British Empire and the others, the French Empire and others in Europe too, same, but the British Empire was the most significant because of its size, what they did was export the bloodline all over the world. And, crucially, I'll get to this later, the secret society network which follows the bloodline to manipulate it and its representatives into positions of power to control the societies they target. So what we had when the colonial empires apparently on the surface broke up was global Babylon. Because what happened on the surface, the colonial powers gave independence to the countries like Australia and America and stuff like that. But in truth, what happened was the bloodline and the secret society network stayed in those countries and have gone on controlling those countries ever since from a central point in Europe. Overwhelmingly London, but there are other places in, in Europe too where, where the, the very significant centers of power for this bloodline network. And there's two types of control. There's a control you can see, touch and taste, communism, apartheid, fascism. And at least the people under those tyrannies understand the situation they're in. They're in a tyranny. And they can see, at least the front men, who are in control of the tyranny. 
Eventually, it might take a long time, but eventually there will be a rebellion against that kind of tyranny where you know where you stand. The greatest form of control, which can go on forever until it's exposed, is a tyranny you can't see, touch and taste. Where you're sitting in a prison cell, but you can't see the bars. Because people don't rebel against not being free when they think they are. And so what happened in this sleight of hand when the colonial powers apparently gave independence is there was a move from a tyranny you could see, colonial control from London overwhelmingly, to a tyranny you couldn't see, which is called democracy, which is called putting a, a cross on a piece of paper every four or five years and then the people you voted for or not voted for often doing what, you, what they bloody like. It's called freedom. It's very good. I'm going to try it sometime. And, and so, what we've had is a hidden tyranny ever since masquerading as freedom. And what these bloodlines and the secret society network they control have done is set up the equivalent of a transnational corporation. As transnational corporations work, they have a headquarters and then in the different countries they have subsidiaries. And the subsidiaries do what the headquarters tell them to do. Corporate policy they call it. Well, what these bloodlines have done is exactly the same, only it's secret societies uh, for subsidiaries. The headquarters, the center of the web in Europe, dictates the ongoing policy which is constant centralization of power in every area of our lives to bring about this point where the few can control the many from a central point. And in each country is the subsidiary network of the secret society network and that network in each country has the job and it's bloody comple completed it a long time ago now of controlling that country's government, any political party that has ch any chance of forming a government, its banking system, its uh, transnational corporation system, its media ownership, and the military, and all these other institutions, medicine, science. And so, having established that in different uh, countries around the world, when the central uh, point, the spider in the, in the center of the web in Europe says, this is what's going to happen now. These subsidiary groups start to uh, bring it about in their sphere of influence, their country. And this is how you see, and it's more and more blatant now, this is how you see the same things happening in every country virtually at the same time. When there's a problem, like um, a financial crisis, engineered of course, then the reaction to the problem, and maybe we could sit down and say, well, maybe we could do that, maybe we could do that, maybe we could do that, what about that, try that. No, no, there's one solution. And in the case we're experiencing now, it's throwing infinite amounts of what we call money at the banking system that created the problem. That is the answer all over the place, because that is how it's coordinated to be. The idea is to control through this web every area of the world. And they've been doing it covertly and building up that, that control to the point now, and I said this years ago, there's going to come a point, because it has to come, if they want to bring from the secret and hidden into changes in society, there has to come a point where this stuff breaks the surface where we can see it, because it has to if it's going to become the changes in society they want. And we're at that point now where it's clearly broken the surface and we can see it. And what they've done is created this tapestry web of transnational corporations and groupings which appear to be different and have different owners and different agendas and competing with each other but it's like going down a high street and you see all these different names and again, they see to, some of them seem to be competing with each other.
could slip into financial panic and a distressing scenario would unfold. More banks could fail, including some in your community. The stock market would drop even more, which would reduce the value of your retirement account. The value of your home could plummet. Foreclosures uh, would rise dramatically. And, and, and if you own a business or a farm, you'd find it harder and harder and expensive to get credit. More businesses will close their doors and millions of Americans could lose their jobs. God bless America. <laughs> then Obama comes in. Change. When he says, we want even more money at the banks. Economists across the spectrum have warned that if we don't act immediately, millions more jobs will be lost and national unemployment rates will approach double digits. More people will lose their homes and their health care and our nation will sink into a crisis that at some point may be unable to be reversed. Different maths, same face. Be afraid, be very afraid. The big bag monster is coming now that we've invented him. Economic crisis. And... Um, just a, just a puppet. And his uh, economic uh, team, people like Larry Summers, uh, Paul Volcker, Tim Geithner, they're straight from the very institutions that created the crisis and they've been placed in uh, positions to solve the crisis, which means giving more and more money to the banks that they represent. Trillions of dollars. And they're talking about it being the, the, the uh, bigger crisis than the 1930s. In many ways, um, in, on many levels, that, I think that's, that's absolutely right. What they want, and I've been saying this since November now, what they want, and we're two-thirds there, don't want to be the bringer of bad news, but, you know, let's face it, was to crash the economy, first of all, and create a massive problem. Stage two is for those that have created the problem to come into government and hurl enormous amounts of cuckoo land money at the problem because what they wanted to do in stage two is empty the, the weapons of government to respond to the crisis. And once those weapons, those guns have been emptied in terms of response possibilities, then they want to crash it here and crash it in a way that there can be no government response. They want to create absolute chaos on so many levels so that the people say, save us, do something. And the do something will bring in this centralized, global, fascist, um, Orwellian state. This, as a result of it. Not just a financial crisis, they want wars as well. They want to, first of all, destroy America. Because if you want a world government, then you can't have superpowers in the world that can say no to the world government financially and militarily. So as I've been saying for years now, what, peop what we're seeing in America is the using America to destroy America. D it's being destroyed militarily because it's on, fighting on so many fronts. And financially, I was there for two months recently, that country is on the brink of financial catastrophe. Not just a crisis, catastrophe. Uh, with what's going on there, which has not hit the public arena yet. And the other thing they want in problem, reaction, solution is people to riot and be violent in response to what's going on because then they've got a problem that they can offer the solution to which is increases in the police state to meet the problem of violent reaction of the public to the problems they've created and also to justify putting people into these uh, uh, concentration camps, you can only call them, um, holding centers they're called, which exist all over the world, particularly in America, um, under an organization called FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. Again, people uh, 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 around the conspiracy research world have been talking about this now for uh, 10 years, and it's coming to, to pass. And it, you know, I, I don't believe in violence. I, I will not be violent. I will not be violent. I don't care what the situation is. I do want to be violent. I'm not going to add my energy to that crap. But a lot of people would be in response to this. And to do that, you need to get rid of their guns. That's why when Hitler came in, he, he wanted to disarm the population because then a big problem of resistance had gone. It's Rahm Emanuel that is now leading the campaign in America to take away more and more guns from the population because he knows that an, an armed uh, population prepared to use them in certain situations makes them much more easy, difficult to control. But I would say this, Martin Luther King, the limitation of riots, moral questions aside, is that they cannot win and their participants know it. Hence, rioting is not revolutionary but reactionary because it invites defeat. It involves an emotional catharsis, but it must be followed by a sense of futility. And oh, what we need is not to riot, not to be violent, not even to go in mass protests, so be my guest if people want to do that. 
But they're not frightened of protests, this, this gang. They're terrified of us not complying with our own enslavement. And when we stop doing that, they've lost their power. No violence necessary. They want us to be violent. Um, inside job, problem, reaction, solution, 9-11. Won't go into all that now, but it's been, it's been well documented. But another classic one. And interestingly, 1997, the Grand Chessboard, Brzezinski book. Moreover, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may find it more difficult to fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues, except in the circumstances of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. What was it? Three years later? Four years later? Thank you. Massive external threat, which has justified so much. I love that. So David Dees is a great artist. Anything like this in this presentation comes from David Dees, um, a brilliant uh, artist who uh, portrays real powerful statements in, in pictures like this. Jet fuel, that's a good one. These are buildings, by the way, um, in other parts of the world that burned incredibly more intensely than the Twin Towers, and none of them fell. That one seems to be falling, but it's not. It's the, it's the, the way the, the, the building is actually um, uh, built. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Put that where I can see it. Okay. We're not doing bad. There you go. Reichstag fire, which um, Hitler did. Blame someone else for it. Justified uh, the uh, takeover of the state as a result of it. Same thing, problem, reaction, solution. Again, um, Saddam Hussein was, was, was the guy, we've got to go into Iraq because of Saddam Hussein. This is Donald Rumsfeld, the defense secretary at the time of the invasion of Iraq, um, meeting Saddam Hussein in 1983 to arrange for Reagan Bush administration to um, ship chemical and biological weapons for use against the Iranians. Um, this is a an American mainstream newspaper report from 2002. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld, the U.S. Defense Secretary and one of the most strident critics of Saddam Hussein, met the Iraqi president in 1983 to ease the way to US, for U.S. companies to sell biological and chemical weapons, including anthrax and bubonic plague cultures, according to newly declassified government documents. That again and again, you see people creating the problem who then become the people to solve the problem. He was on the board of a, 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 a European engineering giant called ABB in 2000 when they sold nuclear equipment to North Korea. He then becomes defense secretary and says North Korea is a danger because it's got nuclear equipment. <laughs> Alongside uh, uh, problem, reaction, solution comes what I call the totalitarian tiptoe. Very simple. You're going there to Z, uh, to Z but you're at A. And if you go in one leap, you know the change is going to be so vast, people are going to say what's going on. So you go in as big a jump as you can, but you try not too big a jump that so many people will, will start to ask questions. And each jump is promoted and projected as unconnected to all the others. That's how the European Union, uh, a centralized dictatorship now, uh, was um, totalitarian tiptoed out of a free trade area. 75% um, of laws in Britain now originate in the European Union. And the European Union uh, pass a law, a British Parliament or any other European Parliament pass a law, doesn't matter, that one takes precedent. They want the same in uh, America with the North American Union, which Obama is going to be pushing. Fascism, you really think it would be this obvious. The stepping stone approach has what's got us this far, where so many stepping stones have now been made that it is becoming obvious to anyone with a mind. I'll quickly go through this because uh, um, there's so much to get through, but I, it's like I say, I wish I had hours. The other um, uh, coordinate is to understand that they want people to be a believer. They want people to believe in something, because once you have a belief system that is rigid, then you um, uh, become less of a problem. They want religious belief systems, political belief systems, racial belief systems, self-identity belief systems, anything that puts you in a prison of the mind. Because the, the, you, you'll then filter through this process of um, the way the neurons fire in the brain, you will filter reality through the belief system. Religions. Um, in the end, um, religions are invariably, the major religions are worshipping the same force. It's not uh, explained like that, but that's what goes on. Again, out of Atlantis and Lemuria and then those civilizations that, that followed, um, the worshipping of um, uh, 
the moon goddess and the sun god, the worshipping of the moon and the sun, was prevalent. And it uh, manifested in various um, religions, and not least from this part of the world, which if you think about it, is the religion factory. Christianity, um, Islam, uh, Judaism, Hinduism, all came out of this part of the world, these major religions. And when you strip them down, they are invariably sun and moon um, worshipping religions. So in Babylon... They worshipped the uh, Queen Semiramis, the sun goddess, uh, Nimrod, known as, so known as Baal or Bel, the, the, the sun god, and Tamos, who was the but fearing not paying the mortgage at the end of the month, fearing of having your house foreclosed. They all lock you in to a sense of needing to survive. And the other thing that these, uh, these entities do is feed off human energy. And to feed off human energy, they have to pull humans into an energetic state that they can feed off. If you're in a state of harmony, they can't feed off it because never the twain shall meet vibrationally. So they pull us or seek to pull us into a state of disharmony, of stress, of fear, of conflict, of aggression, of, of anger and all the rest of it. Because that's pulling us into an energetic state that they can then feed off because that's their energetic state. Um, and they seem to operate in what an uh, astrophysicist friend of mine called uh, Giuliana Conforto calls interspace planes, which is like a neutral zone between uh, dimensions, where you need um, to, as she puts it, find a source of energy because there's not a natural source of energy there on the scale that there is within um, a, a fully-fledged uh, reality dimension, whatever you want to call it. And I said to Credo Mutwa, do you have anything in your culture that relates to interspace planes, these neutral zones? He said, oh yes, he said, we call them the heaven between heavens. He said, that's where the Chittahuri are. Um, and so th that takes them so close to visible light and the um, reality that we're experiencing. And what they're doing is feeding off human energy by manipulating us into an energetic state in which they can feed off and also to keep us in mind and not open to consciousness. Years ago, last time I came to um, Australia, I had a strange experience. I spoke in Sydney and afterwards I was introduced to this Freemason who said he was 33rd degree or something. He wanted to meet me because he wanted to know how I knew what I knew. He said, yeah, how do you know that? You're not supposed to know these things. So anyway, I met him and he said... Um, I said, I'm a good Freemason, he said. I, I'm, I'm trying to fight some of the bad things. I said, okay. Um, he said, um, if you come to Canberra, he said, I'll show you around Canberra and I'll, I'll show you the, the, the Freemasonry imagery. So, okay, I'll go. So I went to Canberra and I met this guy and he showed me all around the Parliament building and all the street plan around there and all the rest of it. And then he took me into the, the, um, the war memorial, the war museum memorial in, in Canberra. And my God, it is a blaze with Illuminati and reptilian symbolism. And when you go into the part where the unknown soldier grave is, on the four corners and the pillars are depictions of soldiers, men and women. And then you've got the light coming up from the top of their head going up. And you've got a reptilian um, uh, figure s sitting above that, almost policing the connection to out there and this satanic symbolism and all this stuff and when you look at the um, the sponsors of the war museum um, a number of them are like a who's who of the Illuminati in um, in Australia according to this guy anyway I'll tell you what he said to me he said we need to get you some money I said what do you mean he said yeah he said we need to get you some money to fund what you're doing I said well hold on I said how are you gonna do that he said we'll give you a credit card I don't know who we was he said we'll give you a credit card I said well how will that help me he said well we fix the computer system so no matter how much you spend, it never registers. He says, that's, he says, that's how we get our money, right? So, so anyway, I thought, I'm not sure about that in the least. And we said goodbye. He said, look, I've got lots of things to tell you. And never heard from him again. Disappeared from the face of the bloody earth. Um, it's still around in Australia, I'm sure, but there you go. So... This, this interspace plane is, 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 is one of the kind of, kind of um, stumbling blocks energetically which, which is trying to manipulate us from getting um, uh, connected to the full nature of who we are. 
So this is kind of, seems to be the, the structure, certainly at this level, it goes further out up to that schism, I believe, but at this level, you've got the reptilian entities, um, and Nephilim, that was the, the name of the hybrid bloodline in the Bible, the Nephilim, uh, just one of many, many names that they're called around the world in different cultures. The reptilian entities um, possess their um, hybrid stooges. And the secret society network within this reality manipulates the stooges and their gophers and agents into the positions of power at the top of the pyramids in all these different countries. These are the subsidiary networks I'm talking about. They then uh, control um, all these other things like politics, finance, media, military, religion, and the royal uh, networks because that locks into them. And then down come the people. And these people at the top who appear in everyday reality and on the news bulletins often to be at odds with each other and fighting each other. And there's lots of infighting goes on among these people because they're so imbalanced that they're going to, of course they're going to fight for them, among themselves but there is a level that knocks heads together when it gets in the way. And so they're manipulating, playing different um, countries and groups and Islamic and stuff off against each other. And if you notice, the people that declare the wars never bloody fight them. These people go off like silly sods and fight them. And these people who have nothing against these people, but those people tell them they should and, they, and all the rest of it. And the people fight among themselves, creating great stress, great uh, disharmony, energy to be absorbed and all the rest of it. Um, because they're manipulated by the tiny few into this stuff. I mean, if George Bush, boy George Bush, had been in Iraq when the first bullet was fired, he'd have been under a bed in Houston when the second bugger went off. These people do not fight the wars, they just declare them. We fight the wars, and if we stop fighting the sodden wars and came together, we made the whole system completely impotent. So these are schism people coming down the levels of reality and they feed off the energy that we um, generate through our states of emotional and mental states and they manipulate that. Now the one energy they can't take, um, the many energies they can't take, that they're in harmony, but what we call love, the energy of the heart, no way they want anything to do with that. They can't, they can't cope with it and they can't sync with it and they want to shut that energy off and that's what they do by manipulating society and playing us off against each other. There's a guy called uh, Mr. Emoto, a Japanese researcher I spent a long time with, spent a whole weekend with once in London. We actually wrote a book together, funnily enough, um, just not uh, writing but just talking and it all being trans translated. Um, and he's famous for filming... Uh, water crystals um, where he has put the water in contact with various vibrational states and indeed just writing love on the side of the uh, container or hate or putting a mobile phone on it or whatever and what he then does is, and I've seen his, um, his uh, uh, laboratory and stuff in um, Tokyo, he freezes it very very quickly and what is then captured in the water crystal is the vibration of the love on, written on the side. Because uh, you write love, generates love. If that's the, the, the motive of writing love, uh, hate, all the rest of it. So that is what a water crystal exposed to words of love and appreciation looks like. This is what a water crystal looks like when it's exposed to um, hate. Hate. Now, that's the world before the schism. This is the world afterwards. And it's this energy that re represented by that crystal that these guys want us to produce and, and the operations, uh, the, the level that they operate on themselves. So we need to be very careful about the way we talk to each other, the way we express things, because if you can put the word love on the side of a container of water and create that difference or hate, imagine what we're doing to the energy field and our own individual energy fields as we interact when we are hurling abuse at each other.
But that's what these guys want. That's, they want to conflict, schism, break up. The society is just a, a manifestation of that schism. So that again is love and appreciation. This is a crystal uh, from water that had a mobile phone tied to it. And everyone's got a mobile phone. Oh, I've got a mobile phone. Very so convenient. Yeah, they burn my brain. It's good. <laughs> Very so convenient. You don't have to get anyone to burn your brain for you. It does it automatically. So the idea, and my God, have they, have, 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 have they succeeded up to this point, is to turn humanity at war with itself. That's the way they do it. And uh, in this film, uh, Monsters, Inc., which I took my son to years ago when he was a little boy, I nearly fell off the bloody floor because that was all about monsters going from the monster world where there was no um, uh, source of energy into the human world, frightening children, the scream... Uh, was caught in a, uh, in a kind of tube and they brought it back to the monster world to um, uh, be the power system of their world. And fear is the biggest, um, not just control of humanity and suppressor of <laughs> Good. If we really look in the mirror and see the true reflection of ourselves, this system will collapse. As Martin Luther King said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. We are at that time of challenge and controversy. Where do we stand? Comply or non-compliance? Free your mind from the programming that holds us in little me. Free ourselves from the hypnotic trance we've been put in. It's a mad, 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 mad world, yes. But why? Because what has been kept from us crucially, above all else, is who we are, the nature of life, and the nature of the reality that we live in. I started out um, after ridiculously outrageous things happened to me about 20 years ago. The top of my head blew off and uh, it was, uh, I was never the same again. Thank you, God. Um, I started to ask big questions because unless we ask the big questions, and most people don't because we're so focused on survival and, and, and today, uh, surviving another day, you never get the big answers, how can you? And when you ask the big questions, the world looks very different. You start to realize, for instance, that there is a multi-leveled conspiracy to um, enslave humanity on multi-levels, mentally, emotionally, and therefore physically. And some other questions I started to ask, and this is, this is where I want to concentrate on in this, um, uh, this first section, because it's so important, because in the second section, when I get into the the conspiracy as it's unfolding today in our everyday lives, that will start to make so much more sense in terms of why society is as it is, why it's structured as it is, why things are done as they are, once we realize um, what uh, reality is. Who are we? Where are we? What is reality? What is life? How many people in the world actually ask that in their entire lifetimes until they get towards the end maybe? And when you ask those questions, you realize it's all an illusion. This physical world that we take so seriously, that we think is so real, is just an illusion decoded by our body computer system to give the illusion of solidity. Great American comedian Bill Hicks, who said, who said this, all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration. We are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There's no such thing as death. Life is only a dream. And we are the imagination of ourselves. Encapsulates it. And really the bottom line of the conspiracy is to manipulate our imagination of ourselves so that we imagine ourselves to be little me and powerless and therefore controllable by the few. 
It's all an illusion. It sounds crazy to start with, but I, I, for the one and only time in my life in 2003 in the Brazilian rainforest, I took uh, this, this uh, psychoactive uh, rainforest plant called ayahuasca. And, and uh, some people have a bad experience. I had a fantastic experience. For five hours, this female voice it took the, took the, the theme of, uh, or the, the, the uh, expression of, this female voice, as loud as mine is now, took me, uh, talked to me for five hours about the nature of reality and how it was all an illusion, explaining why it was an all illusion. And it was hilarious. I mean, my feet were literally in the air a number of times. It was so funny, because it is funny when you realize what we take seriously. Um, and I came back after that, and I started looking in the scientific area and quantum physics and all this stuff to see um, if I could um, support what that uh, voice had said um, from the mainstream science and the, the cutting edge of science. And I found that you could do it easily. Why? Because science is a series of disciplines, vast numbers of disciplines, and the buggers never talk to each other. They don't connect their own dots within science. Why? Because they're not encouraged to. Indeed, the opposite from encouraged to, because once they connect the dots, woo, this is life then. And you, 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 when you do connect the dots, you realize that if they did, they'd already realize that this reality is an illusion. I, was, uh, I talked in, um, in London in May last year, and a friend of mine who uh, is a healer and he, 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 a scientist and he works in scientific circles, and he'd uh, done this presentation or, or been at this event at the Royal Society, like the, the holy grail of science, mainstream science in London. And he's met all these people and he comes to my talk, right? You know, I mean, I left school at 15 to play uh, soccer. You know, I never passed an exam in my life. Thank you, God. Okay, so, and he met four or five of these guys who'd been at the Royal Society, mainstream scientists, and he said, what the hell are you doing here? And they said, well, we've come to hear it how it really is. Because they bloody knew this. But if they talked about it within their, their um, science, within their discipline, within their arena, the funding stops, the ridicule starts, and they no longer... Um, are able to progress within the mainstream science. Why? Why do you want to? Follow what is. So, all the time we are decoding reality in an apparently solid three-dimensional way. This is an amazing guy. You might have seen some of these on the internet. This is an amazing guy who draws uh, chalk pictures on the pavement and all the pictures you're going to see are on a flat pavement. But because of the way he draws them, he gets the brain to decode them in a three-dimensional form. He's tricking the brain into doing this. These are all on flat pavements. Incredible guy, what he does. And, and here's another example. Because the brain is decoding reality, and you can manipulate that, and that's another big thing of the conspiracy, which I'll get to. All these things are optical illusions, tricking the brain to read reality in a certain way. And it could be done on a very deep level, and it is. Again, is that a, a, a seven-section uh, box, or, is it a, 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 or image, or is it a box, or what is it? It depends how your brain reads it. Uh, most people seeing this for the first time will read that as a bird in the bush. Actually, it says a bird in the, the bush. Uh, because the brain is used to certain things, you can drop things in that are there, but it doesn't read them because it reads according to the program that it's taken on. Uh, these uh, kind of red colors are exactly the same, but because of their relationship to other colors, the brain reads them differently, and they appear to be not the same, but they are. As Einstein said, reality is an illusion, albeit a persistent one. And the reason for its persistence will become clear before we finish this first section. So I, I, I followed this amazing synchronicity that suddenly appeared in my life 20 years ago. And it took me through the five sense level of this and how secret societies connect and all that stuff. I'll get into that in the second section. And then it took me through interdimensional stuff. And eventually from 2003 onwards with that ayahuasca thing, right up to the present